This program is designed to provide general information with regards to the subject matters covered. This information is given with the understanding that neither the hosts, guests, sponsors, or station are engaged in rendering any specific and personal, medical, financial, legal, counseling, professional service, or any advice. You should seek the services of competent professionals before applying or trying any suggested ideas. Good morning, truth seekers and true crime junkies. Welcome back to another episode of Hit the Road Jack, Finding the Zodiac. Uh, Today, we are going to pick up where we left off after a few bits and pieces of some laundry from last week, um, right back to where we were, which was an article in regards to Graysmith. And then we are going to move into um, into some handwriting Uh, education in regards to the use of both hands for individuals who are ambidextrous and the the notion that I have um, included in this that there was a possibility some of the letters were written by the non-dominant hand and the suspect in this particular case and our sound engineer Juan has graciously allowed me to look at his handwriting because he is also ambidextrous dexterous and he also writes with both hands. So we did a little example of his handwriting that we're going to compare and pit next to some of the letters that we found in the Gray Smith article as we go along. So I'm going to move pretty quickly here. Um, one of the things that I had last week is again these these Uh, comments that are coming up in YouTube that I am not able to actually locate or find. So I do get the email and down here we can see this email that I received from Mr. JSV650. He said he, I had, I had said happy holidays and also those videos I had made 10 years ago. I took it down because I didn't want you to think I was some weirdo. Tom is a narcissist and he attacks anyone that sees things differently than him. He is now posting videos discrediting anyone who wrote a book on the case. Go figure. It's about time. I've only been talking about it for a year. Thank you, Tom. Problem here is is that Tom has actually engaged these individual suspects as possible suspects on his board and allowed people to throw these people around one way or another, theorizing the the possibilities of them being the Zodiac rather than focusing where he should. All of it really is just really distractory um, just to keep you looking in the other direction while he bashes those that he doesn't feel he wants the attention to be put towards. So um, I did go back or I did attempt to go from this email to reply to this particular um, uh, posting and I could not find it when I went into YouTube. It didn't matter where I looked. It was not there. So I went ahead and I responded here to Mr. JSB650. First off, um, don't take down any of your videos. Whether you think I think you're a weirdo or not, I don't care. Everybody has their own um uh, likes and dislikes. And I've always told people don't yuck my yum. So if it's something that I like, you shouldn't yuck it because it's for me, not for you. Um, anyways, also, um, I don't think that you're a weirdo by putting those up except for maybe the watch. No, I'm kidding. I I, I'm really kidding. Um, I have heard from many people that Tom is a narcissist and I've experienced this behavior on his part several times. Um, bottom line, he certainly is not thinking about the people affected by these crimes, even if he is trying to call out the authors uh, who thought only about themselves as well when they put these stories together and made money off of it. He has likely made as much money as some of the top earners in the misinformation or recreation of their stories about these crimes. And really, to me, it's all a shame. And I hope to bring this behavior to light since Tom didn't find it important to do so until I started calling all of these people out. He will undoubtedly attack the very people who got him to where he is now, and that includes Robert Graysmith, and undoubtedly will restart his campaign against me if he hasn't already. Bottom line is, is that I have never seen anything anywhere that indicated that Tom was calling out Graysmith in regards to his book. The leading media um, notion behind these cases has been one that has flown Um, high above our heads without us being aware of what's really going on. And that's why I look to bring this stuff out. 
Now, back to this particular article that the Los Angeles Times newspaper um, put out on February 9th of 1986 by Richard Hartnett, dejecting Robert Graysmith's theories as lies and glorification of the Zodiac Killer as an avenue for psychos to follow. So back to that article, I left off. Armstead Maupin, a San Francisco Chronicle columnist and author of the popular series Tales of the City, had been an unwitting participant in a scandal concerning a forged Zodiac letter. In an interview with United Press International, Richard M. Hartnett Maupin said, I think the public has already been terrified far too much by this boogeyman story and expresses and expressed concerns that Grace Smith's book would revive the hysteria surrounding the unsolved mystery. Maupin's words proved prophetic when, shortly after the publication of Zodiac, more hoaxes and forged letters plagued police and the public. The boogeyman story began all over again on the other side of the continent when a man responsible for several shootings in New York began to send letters to local newspapers and claimed to be the Zodiac. Police eventually captured the copycat and a search of his belongings produced a well-thumbed copy of Grace Smith's book. Some critics argued that the crime spree might have been avoided had Grace Smith not provided such a sensational and glorified portrait of the Zodiac as an inspiration. Richard Hartnett's review of Zodiac appeared in the Los Angeles Times on February 9th, 1986, and offered some of the only media criticism of the book. So this t this makes me kind of think of um, all of the individuals that were fake suspects and the media attention that they received and how their stories went worldwide, if not just across the United States in the news. However, when there was criticism in regards to it or when they failed to cut the, the um, the butter basically and didn't really actually have what it was that they said they had and were lying to begin with we get this small little blip in the media that says this person wasn't real and nobody sees that nobody remembers that everybody just remembers the mass media attention that was given to the fact that this new suspect was out so i get lots of phone calls from my friends and i get people hitting me up nanette did you see there's a new new zodiac suspect and i then have to go and find this particular you know media or news that's hit in regards to this person and quickly sh show how this individual it, it couldn't even have possibly have been the Zodiac. But um, so here, this is the first thing that I've actually seen where somebody has talked down about what Robert Graysmith has done. Uh, it says a good account of all. So let's see. Hartnett wrote that a good account of all the facts in the Zodiac affair would have been a valuable contribution, but Graysmith, the newspaper cartoonist, took on the role of amateur sleuth rather than historian. He neglects those parts of the historical record that don't fit into his scenario. Most of Graysmith's scenarios revolved around Arthur Lee Allen, a convicted child molester who first came to the attention of authorities in 1971 when an estranged friend told police Allen had confessed his intent to commit crimes similar to those of the Zodiac. So he only stated he wanted to commit crimes like it, not that he was it. The former friend had once complained to Allen's brother that the suspect had made improper advances toward his young daughter. There's the motive for this person coming forward and making these statements. But the friend did not reveal this allegation to the police. Investigators did not question the suspect or the accuser about this possible motive to implicate Allen. The subsequent investigation by police in San Francisco and nearby Vallejo included the search of a trailer owned by Allen. However, investigators failed to uncover any evidence to link Allen to the Zodiac crimes. Allen once again came under scrutiny when the California Department of Justice conducted a review of the original Zodiac investigation, but authorities found no evidence to link Allen to the unsolved murders once again. So... In 1986, this investigate, investigative reporter had already found that Allen had been cleared twice by SFPD and the VP and again by the DOJ. Yet Tom participated in the making of the 2007 movie where Allen was still the underlying suspect, which is shameful. I have never heard Tom Voight in 14 years denounce Robert Graysmith or anyone in the media for that matter. Other than Dennis Kaufman, neither had anyone else until this review, which has been on record for more than 36 years. After Graysmith's book and its thinly veiled portrait of Allen made the suspect the subject of local curiosity, another man from Allen's past came forward and claimed Allen had confessed his intent to commit a Zodiac-like crime. So this is just an another case where another person has jumped on the bandwagon to join in. Police had arrested Allen and the accuser more than 30 years earlier during a fight between the two men. The informant had committed several armed robberies and hoped to avoid a prison sentence by him 
implicating Alan. So here we have somebody who's looking to save their own butt, jumping on the bandwagon with somebody else, and and we call they're calling them friends of Alan's. I, I'm not really sure how that applies, but. Um, the Vallejo police captain and retired detective launched another investigation and eventually searched Allen's home. The investigation also failed to connect Allen to the Zodiac crimes, but Allen's identity as the prime suspect in the unsolved murders reached the newspapers. This is the greatest disservice done to anybody. And I think that this is why we have venue changes in the courtrooms because people do not get a fair shake once the media has pasted their name all over the place, indicating their belief that that person has committed some crime or has done something nefarious. Um, in interviews conducted shortly before he died in 1992, Allen repeated repeatedly declared his innocence and complained of harassment from the police and others. News reports of Allen's death often quoted Gray Smith's book and repeated erroneous information about the suspect, further blurring the distinction between Allen and his fictional counterpart. Graysmith's questionable efforts to link Allen to the crimes began in the introduction to Zodiac, where he informed the readers that one of the Zodiac's victims may have known his true name, and this victim, in the act of turning Zodiac into the police, had been murdered. According to Graysmith, the victim in question, Darlene Farron, engaged in an intense argument with a mysterious stranger Graysmith believed to be a man identified only as Lee, the nickname often used by Arthur Lee Allen. In Graysmith's scenario, a car chase to Blue Rock Springs Park ended when the stranger approached Farron's vehicle, uttered her nickname, and proceeded to open fire on the victims. Farron's companion lived to tell a very different story, and the original police reports effectively refute Graysmith's version of the events. Graysmith would later claim that a witness and his sister had heard Farron and her killing and her killer arguing just before the shooting occurred. The witness in question never claimed to have heard such an argument, and he told police a very different story. The witness did not have a sister. So here's where Alla's life fell apart, and, and I have never seen Tom Boyd apologize or publicly declare him not a suspect. In fact, when I came um, to the scene, Alla was still a viable suspect on Tom Boyd's site, and, it's shame, and this is shameless, narcissistic behavior, absolutely third investigation and media grabbed wind of this and let it fly for 30 plus years. So literally speaking, we've had three investigations on this man. He's been cleared by handwriting. He's been cleared by DNA and he's been cleared by fingerprints. How many more times can somebody be cleared? And yet we still see a movie put out in 2007 that he is the underlying person that this movie is based off of. So an almost completely fictitious person is what uh, Graysmith used in in the Zodiac. I think it's Zodiac Unmasked, and he called Star was everywhere I looked. Robert Graysmith by Zodiac, a uh, real life suspect named Arthur Lee Allen using the pseudonym Star. Graysmith creates the villain of of the piece, a disturbed, violent man who is most likely responsible for the Zodiac murders and suspected in murders of more than 40 young women in and around Santa Rosa. Now, this is probably the only part of Grace Smith's book that I really pay attention to is the suspects that he believes can be attributed to the Zodiac since the Zodiac declared he would no longer tell people what his crimes were. And these 40 young women in and around Santa Rosa is exactly why uh, we had the Santa Rosa Police Department working with Dennis in regards to Jack's evidence because Jack fit the best scenario. Star is so frightening that his own family believed he was the Zodiac and informed the police of their suspicions. Police believe Star was the elusive killer, but could not find the proof they needed to put him behind bars. The book ends with the author's conclusion that Star was the Zodiac, forever damning the character to internal infamy. The character of Bob Hall Star and the man known as Arthur Lee Allen are two different people, yet for years the two have been synonymous to the public. Just as TV's fugitive Dr. Richard Kimball was not Dr. Sam Shepard. Now also remember that we talked about the Shepard case in this particular, so it, it, doesn't, it doesn't shock me to see some of these being cross-referenced when we talk about the Zodiac Killer because I believe there's a good chance that Jack could have been that person as well. Um, but just as the TV's fugitive Dr. Richard Kimball was not Dr. Sam Shepard and Dracula was not Vlad, the impaler, the difference between Star and Allen lies in the gray area between fact and fiction. 
Robert Gray Smith based his fictional character on a real person, yet the fictional character exists in a work of nonfiction. Gray Smith informed readers that he had changed the man's name, but few were aware or would bother to suspect that the author had also changed the facts to suit his purpose. Now, I haven't changed any of the facts in these cases, where they were, how they happened, who the individuals were, the um, eyewitness accounts. I have only used the information that has been put out there in order to show that Jack cannot be excluded from it. It does not necessarily mean Jack is the killer. It simply means that Jack cannot be excluded and he should be looked at. The subtle and deliberate manner in which Gray Smith transformed Arthur Lee Allen's life and person in order to give the reader the impression that he was the Zodiac is almost invisible to those who do not have access to or do not seek the facts. Relying on Gray Smith to be truthful, the reader learns about Star and therefore Allen through his words. As readers are introduced to Star, they are led down a path that has been carefully constructed by an author who was willing to distort the truth in order to convince readers that the character and by proxy the suspect he represented was the Zodiac. The process of proje uh, preju prejudicing the jury of readers begins on the back cover of Grace Smith's book Zodiac, where he promised his readers the author's theory of the Zodiac's true identity, which is based on eight years of research and hundreds of facts never before released. These claims give the author and his conclusions credibility. On page 15 of Zodiac, Graysmith introduced a mysterious stranger as a man who frightened Zodiac victim Darlene Farron in the months before her death. Several people claim to have seen this man, but in the decades since the crime, no one has identified this individual. According to Graysmith, Darlene was scared to death of the stranger who watched her constantly. Now, I did want to kind of point out that the descriptions don't match of Star and of, of Arthur Lee Allen or this man, Bob, that has been seen in, um, oh, I'm sorry, back up one. Hypothesis that the cheese letter in this card could be real since Zodiac handmade the Halloween card and could have created this card the same way with the same exact font, which was something I hadn't considered before I found this article. Because we know that the Zodiac was creating, I guess there was some way to go in and create, pick your font, pick your image, pick these things to create the cards that you wanted, that it is very real that we would be seeing the same style or same type of font in that particular card that was sent as the cheese letter. Now, um, Maybe Star became the author's surname for the Zodiac because he actually seen this piece of communication and read it to say Star instead of the killer's J JT or Jack Terrence, or in this case, JTAR hints that he liked to drop as a particular clue to his identity in his communications as we have seen so far, but did not catch the play on these letters. Um, for gosh sakes, I've shown so many of these hints dropped in all the communications, which we will see as we continue to go through them. Either way, this card came from Voight's site and on a whim of bad character claimed he and his crew decided to perpetrate a game uh, against on, on Dennis and I. Um, I looked at the Zodiacs, Jays and Jacks, and they are written in this like S shape form, which coincidentally matches this image that we're seeing as star. They might have had the Zodiacs to reference, but there's no way that Voight had Jack's handwriting to make it coincidentally match. I think this communication is now under research due to suspicious circumstances at best, and it could possibly be a real um, communication. So I, I went in and I pulled out some of these J's, which if they were sitting alone by themselves would look like S's kind of laying on their sides. But that's exactly what we got up here in this star or JTAR image. So one is a play off of the other, and obviously Tom is playing off of um, Graysmith. So again, we're back to the, the point that he is um, promoting whatever story Graysmith had while um, literally taking credit for having the most information, the most knowledge, the most facts, and knowing everything there is to know about this case. <clears throat> On page 18, readers learned that a strange man named Bob had known Darlene and that Bob is not the man's real name. Later, this Bob will become Star. And although Darlene Farron did know a man named Lee, there is no evidence that Arthur Lee Allen was that man. Neither Star nor Allen matches the physical description of Bob, who was said to be five feet, eight inches tall or so, hair curly, wavy, dark, 
uh, wavy dark hair. Alan was at least six feet tall, practically bald, weighed 200 pounds, and was 36 years old. One witness cited in Zodiac stated that Bob was 30 to 28 and not heavy. He wore glasses. Alan did not wear glasses and was by any definition heavy. Page 39 introduces the theory that Darlene had an argument with a stranger who then followed her to Blue, Rings, uh, Blue Rock Springs Park and killed her. Although there is no evidence that Darlene argued with such a man that night, Graysmith proceeds to tell the readers that a Vallejo detective uncovered such information. In reality, police had learned that a witness had seen a waitress, not identified as Darlene Farron, talking to a man in the parking lot of Darlene's place of work. This event occurred the afternoon before the midnight shooting, and the witness stated that the man and woman appeared to be talking about a vehicle, not arguing as Gray Smith has claimed. The description of the man seen talking to a waitress in the parking lot does not match the description of the man who shot Darlene, although Gray Smith continues to imply that the two men are the same individual. The descriptions of the man who was seen talking to a waitress in the parking lot does not match the description of Bob, yet Gray Smith continues to imply that the two men are one and the same. The description of the man who was seen talking to a waitress in the parking lot, the man who shot Darlene and Bob do not match the descriptions of Bob Starr, but Graysmith leads the readers to believe he is all three. Graysmith introduced the villain of his book on a page 260 as Robert, Robert Bob Hall Starr, a weird son of a bitch who must be watched all the time. A brief character study of Star does match Arthur Allen on several counts, including the fact that he lived with his mother in her Vallejo home at the time of the Zodiac murders. Star was highly intelligent and a loner who collects rifles and enjoys hunting. That's all Jack, guys. Like, I, I mean, this man is described. Sometimes people don't even realize it, and they're just simply describing Jack. Star, like Allen, was a pedophile, and Graysmith concluded this would fit in with... Yeah, well, and let me just stop there for a second. Where is Tom Boyd to call out all these, call that out all these years? Um, he didn't. He didn't. He played into it with um, and with it to obtain his overall goal. Now, how dare he go back and refute all the accounts of authors that he promoted all these years to confuse people and keep the mis mystery churning? Um, but now we can actually see that that Robert Graysmith has actually been lying to the public since the beginning. Zodiac's knowledge of school bus routes and vacation times for oh meh. this would fit in with the Zodiac's knowledge of school bus routes and vacation times for kitties. The author does not mention that the Zodiac never demonstrated any knowledge of any bus routes or that anyone who had attended school for at least a year would possess accurate knowledge regarding the vacation vacation times of school children. Gray Smith repeats a theory that Star had access. Oh, and let's just back that up because at this particular time, Jack does have young children in school. Um, they are not his. He is married to Doris Reynolds and she has two small children, which is why I believe that um, uh, Kathleen Johns had actually seen children's clothing in his car at that particular point in time. Um, now, let's see, or actually he would have been with Nora, who also had young children in school at that particular time, I think during the Kathleen Johns abduction. Either way, in both scenarios, both sets of killing sprees, Jack was around small children, albeit not his own. Um, <clears throat> Gray Smith repeats a theory that Star had access to a car similar to that used by the Zodiac at the Blue Rock Springs shooting. The author appears to have had access to the police report detailing the investigation of this possibility, but ne neglects to mention that the same report states that the police learned that Allen had most likely not used that car. The author's efforts to implicate this suspect continued in the years since the publication of Zodiac. Gray Smith spread an unsubstantiated rumor that Allen had received a speeding ticket near the scene of the Zodiac's Lake Berryessa attack. This rumor eventually appeared as a verified fact in a book written by former FBI profiler John Douglas. That's even more disgusting. So now we have somebody who used to be FBI who is continuing the lies and perpetuating this um, a la suspect idea when it isn't true at all. In an article for the website abpnews.com, Graysmith claimed the, that excited SFPD investigators had contacted him with news that initial, D, uh, initial DNA tests had produced a positive match to Allen's DNA. The article described a meeting in which the disappointed investigators broke the bad news that the match was a false positive. The investigators in question stated that no false positive match ever occurred and that the entire story is not true. So again, we have Robert Graysmith just blatantly lying to people. Which brings us to the letter that we're going to discuss in regards to opposite handwriting today, which is the 1978 letter that had been deemed forged. 
Two years after Gray Smith obtained the copyright for his book, the San Francisco Chronicle received the first Zodiac letter in almost four years. Let me tell you why, you guys. Jack actually left California in 1975 and did not return until 1979. However, his brother still lived in the Santa Clara area and Jack had visited him on occasions and still had medical appointments that he needed to at attend back in California for his work comp case. Um, let's see here. Several handwriting experts sub subsequently concluded that the letter was a forgery. And when we talk, we're going to talk about these guys, but Graysmith claimed the letter was an authentic and soon constructed an elaborate, though seriously flawed theory to support this claim. According to Graysmith, the Zodiac used handwriting samples obtained from several different people and an enlarger or projector in order to fabricate his handwriting style. Um... The writing on Brian Hartnell's card door is unmistakably similar to the Zodiac's handwriting, and Morrill himself concluded that the Zodiac was responsible for that message. It is unlikely, if not implausible, that the Zodiac used a projector on this occasion. I actually find it kind of interesting is that every time Morrill has made an identification of one of the letters, it hits the news. <clears throat> but then people want to come back and say that there are document examiners that have, believe that it is not the handwriting of the Zodiac, while Morrill did find that the forged letter was, in fact, written by the same hand as the Zodiac. Um, in Zodiac, Graysmith put forth the theory that Allen was the Zodiac and therefore the author of the Zodiac's many handwritten messages. He used his elaborate projector theory to explain how Allen was able to disguise his handwriting and fool document experts such as Sherwood Morrill, who was only one of several experts to conclude that Allen did not write the Zodiac letters. Graysmith claims, and, and, and is that not a setup in itself? If Morrill is an upstanding truth telling, which as far as I can tell, did a really good job on making an identification in these letters, that he is then downplayed as the only person who believed that Alla was not the Zodiac author. Um, that tells me that there was more working against Morrill than he knew. Graysmith claims in one quick sentence, Sherwood Morrill confirmed my theory. Yet he states that in the 1981, he dropped in on Sherwood Morrill to compare handwriting of the suspect with the Zodiac. And I guess he, he's meaning the uh, Arthur Lee Allens at this point. Um, Zodiac, page 298, paperback edition. If Morrill actually believed that Grace Smith's projector theory was true, he would not continue to exclude or include suspects based on their handwriting. Grace Smith seems oblivious to this blatant contradiction. Official documents and media interviews, as well as the expert's family, demonstrate that Morrill's opinions never changed throughout his many years on the case. Until his death, Morrill stated that he was certain the Zodiac used his normal handwriting when writing the letters, and the expert was unwavering in his belief that he could identify the killer using little more than a bank deposit slip. And I'm pretty much at that point now. I can take a look at a simple message and quickly find the key points that would either constitute that having been written from the same hand as the Zodiac, or not at all. Graysmith's theories collided with modern science when the SFPD crime lab obtained a DNA sample from the envelope that had contained the 1978 letter and compared that sample to DNA taken from Allen shortly after his death. The samples did not match. In an article for the San Francisco Chronicle, Graysmith wondered why authorities would test a letter that everyone believed to be a forgery. That, in my sense, is also the case. So why would we race, waste the resources on a letter we did not believe went, belonged to the Zodiac after the so-called experts claimed that it was a forgery? Um, to me, I, I think that's a little fishy. Um, on an odd statement, considering that Gray Smith was one of the only individuals who had been claiming that the Zodiac had actually written the 1978 letter. Well, Gray Smith would have been right at that particular point. Faced with handwriting and DNA evidence that excluded Allen as the author of the 1978 letter, Gray Smith conveniently began to speculate that mysterious unnamed accomplices might have written the Zodiac letters while Allen committed the actual crimes. It still doesn't make any sense to me. I mean, why would somebody else take the chance of writing the letter and getting busted, taking, uh, accepting the responsibility for this crime when Arthur Lee Allen doesn't even match the eyewitnesses that uh, um, description? Grace, uh, see, my thoughts exactly on the 1978 purported forged letter would not have been a test, would not have been tested against Allen's DNA unless they believed it to be real. Yet another disinformation campaign and disservice to these cases. This is this only provides confusion to the average person's interested in getting to the truth. Gray Smith has quickly embraced this theory since new DNA tests on other Zodiac letters have once again excluded Allen. 
By 1999, Graysmith seemed to have a lot, uh, have lost track of his multiple, if ever flexible, positions on the 1978 letter. In an on-camera interview for the television program Perfect Crimes, Graysmith told viewers that we received a Zodiac letter on the day after Alan was released from Atascadero. Alan was released from Atascadero in August of 1977. So here he is lying again. The letter in question arrived at the offices of the San Francisco Chronicle in April of 1978. And I start to get confused fused because I have two letters and we're going to show those one from April of 78 and one that looks like it was done in July of 78. So the question in regards to the actual dates on these are still up in the air. But once I solidify that, I will certainly let everybody know. In the years since its publication in 1986, Zodiac has become a true crime legend, often referred to as a classic. Graysmith's version of the Zodiac story was adapted for the big screen in David Fincher's 2007 film Zodiac. Like its source material, the film presented a largely fictional version of the story and abused the facts in order to make Arthur Lee Allen seem like the most likely suspect. The movie also relied on Grace Smith's sequel titled Zodiac Unmasked, published in 2002. Like its predecessor, the book departed from the facts in order to convict Allen in the court of public opinion. So everybody stop thinking it's Arthur Lee Allen. I am still getting people hitting me up on my YouTube channel saying I'm stupid and I don't know what I'm talking about. And Arthur Lee Allen is the, is the Zodiac. Um, I, I do get tickled by that and people do need to have something to believe in in their lives but hopefully they will get this podcast and see how how untrue these statements that robert graysmith has made and he is not the god in the zodiac case just like tom Boyd is not the god in the zodiac case this was actually put out, I believe, by Jake Wark because I did find some information that suggests or links that link back to Jake Wark's sites and his um, information that he has on it. So thank you, Jake Wark, for putting out something interesting that actually helps people to understand that Arthur Lee Allen, once again, was only convicted in the eye of the public, not by the not by law enforcement by any means. Now, that brings us to the actual forged letter in this particular case. And um, Tashi was the the victim of this particular um, uh, assertion that this was a forged letter. It, he is actually um, basically, and now this one, I believe, or at least the date that I could tag it to was July 11th of 1978. If it in fact came in in April of 1978, as the other letter that I'm going to show you did, um, Okay, so this says San Francisco Chronicle, July 11th, 1978. So this may very well be the date of the article and not the actual date of the letter. But if this letter was actually written in, in April of 1978, as indicated, I have another one from April of 1978, and it would be consistent with the Zodiac having written more than one communication. This one went to SFPD. The second one went to Vallejo Police Department, and we're going to talk about that. Now, Tashi said that after receiving the letter from the Chronicle, he turned it over to John Shimoda, head of the Postal Service Crime Laboratory in San Bruno, who confirmed the printing as the Zodiacs, which I thought was extremely interesting because we have John Shimoda that had in the Sherry Jo Bates case indicated that the writing of the Bates letters was not done by the Zodiac. Um, so we have this thing that's going back and forth. And now the letter was also certified as a Zodiac message by Sherwood Morrill. So he did, in fact, make an identification. And then our current chief of state document section, Robert Prouty, disagreed. So we have two government officials, obviously at a higher pay grade than Sherwood Morrill, higher pay grade than um, other individuals or law enforcement in these cases where these letters are now being sent to. And they're the only persons that are putting up the opposition to these letters. So John Shimoda, director of Postal Crime Laboratory, and Robert Prouty, chief of state's document section, calls it a forgery, but both government agencies higher up the chain of command than law enforcement, which is why law enforcement is deferring these um, uh, examinations to them over, at, or, over and above, above Sherwood Morrill. Now, I did find um, a, a, a police department memo, in which case it says this is much more than a, co a coincidence and his involvement should be scrutinized. And this is in regards to John Shimoda, Shimoda, who ruled out the Sherry Jo Bates letters as the Zodiac after Morrill actually included them. This one says these letters have been examined by Sherwood Morrill. Um, and then Mr. John Shimoda, Director of Postal Crime Laboratory. And, and this was pretty much just a, um, a notice that was going out because they wanted a third opinion because John Shimoda 
And I do think that there is some play with the postal department here with the way the Zodiac got his messages around, the way that they were postmarked or lack of address or all the things that went along with how we would have been handled as the public if we had walked in to mail a letter at the counter. Um, either way, I did find a website by Richard Grinnell, ZodiacCiphers.com. Seems to be fairly insightful. He has a lot of these letters that are in there. And he talks about the few items that John Shimoda had quoted that was that was how, why he made the decision he did in a non-identification of this letter. He said that... Um, they failed to duplicate the opening introduction. This is the Zodiac speaking. Well, I have a letter right here from 1974 where he didn't open the introduction as this is the Zodiac speaking, yet it is still a very viable and identified uh, Zodiac letter. He also said that um, the hoaxer failed to copy any of these. Instead, they wrote, this is the Zodiac speaking I. As you can see up here in this letter, this is the Zodiac speaking I. As, this, this, as if this has never occurred before, but I'm going to show you that it has here in a minute. And he also said that um, the author of the 1978 letter failed to keep the Zodiac is speaking introduction in line with the text beneath uh, beneath it. In the 1978 letter, they used indented writing to indent. So um, here in 1974, we see indented writing yet again. So it kind of like when Bart Baggett tried to tell me that my handwriting or that I couldn't make a identification because the writing that he had given me to do the comparison with was much larger than Jack's writing that excluded him automatically. He gave me a bullshit reason as to why Jack could not have been the author of these letters because he had never really actively looked at my work. So when we looked at what when we look at what John Shimoda said, we see that same exact thing, which brings us into the actual letters surrounding this time frame. Here is the one to Vallejo PD in April 24th of 1978. Here we have the July 11th, 1978. And yes, they are visibly different in appearances, but so is the Dear Channel 9 newsletter that came in May of 1978. But please take note that they are all indented and also take note that not every line is solely just the statement, this is the Zodiac speaking as some of the letters were back in the 60s. So this one says the um, April 24th, 1978 says, this is the Zodiac speaking, I am. The July 11th, 1978 letter that's called a forgery, this is the Zodiac speaking, I. The G Dear Channel 9 newsletter, this is the Zodiac speaking, you people. And the 1986 letter, this is the Zodiac speaking, I. Once again, so we have an identical form with other letters that the Zodiac is known to have written. Also, what I paid attention to was his space, it's space and time because we're dealing with letters, at least these three, within the a couple months of 1978. The use of the paper was identical, where they used absolutely every bit from one side to the next that they could put their writing to. Another thing that I noticed is this lineup of how the um, left margin has been used by this individual, where it basically starts in front and then it actually wavers and moves back. You can see the writing that moves back across this line here to the left hand side. Ooh and then moves back to the right again. And when you take a look at these, that's exactly what we have happening here. We have it moving back. We see that the word that actually extends to the left beyond the line where it starts with the other writing, and then it moves back into the right again. And same here in the Channel 9 newsletter. It starts more to the right, and then it works its way backwards to the left, and then slightly moves itself back to the right again. And of course, we've seen the exact same thing happen in the 1986 letter, um, where the, there's always some type of protruding writing to the left into the left margin. Now, um, graphology is based on your present time and your use of space and your activities, your energy exertion, your relation to others during that particular time frame. So it is expected that at different times in people's lives, they may actually react or, or I'm sorry, use that space differently based on how they feel, how they see the world, how they aspire to be or do things. So that brought that well, I'm sorry. Let's take a look really quick at, um, so this is the SLA letter that I just had there from 1974. I wanted to notate, I, I wanted to notate that obviously there are other 
communications out there that he did not start with I am the Zodiac, and that includes the Count Marco letter. Um, they did say that this 1978 letter um, from the postmark and the zip code number is 940. It was determined that the letter was mailed Tuesday from somewhere in either San Mateo County or Santa Clara County. Now, Santa Clara County only then just describes Jack again. Not only was that where he was in 1970 two when he met Nora, 1971, 1972. I believe he kept his house, Dennis said, until 1972. But his brother Charles had always lived in San Jose. So he always had a home base there. Um, again, the SLA letter also came from Jake Ward's site back in 2001 via Dennis Kaufman. Um, and again, I had discussed that Jack and his family had lived in Minnesota from 75 to early 77 and moved to Texas in 77 to about 79. But Charles Terrence resided in San Jose this whole entire time. And we know that Jack traveled, traveled avidly back and forth. Where are we at on time? Oh man, we got 10 minutes to get through this. Oh, here we go. Now Juan, we're going to introduce or say hello to my sound engineer, Juan. Hi there. How are you doing? Can you hear me? No, I'm in the show. Can you hear me anyway. now? Oh, I can hear you now. <laughs> Hi, Juan. <laughs> hey. So you gave me an opportunity to look at your handwriting because you have been known to write with both your hands. Correct. And you said that it had been quite some time since you used the left hand because it used to be something you did as presentations on whiteboards and you found it easier, obviously, to write with your left hand on the right on the whiteboard. So you gave me graciously both these samples, correct? Yes. Yeah, so basically, I would have something like uh, my notes on my right hand and the only hand that I had free to write with was my left hand. So that's what I would use to write on the whiteboard. And you got pretty good at it at one point, evidently. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I have lost practice since then, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we can see that. <laughs> so Thanks. basically the the left hand side of this is your your dominant hand, which is your right hand, correct? Yes. And then the right side is the version of your non-dominant, your left hand, and the writing that you had done with that. So basically I did do some graphology on this particular writing for Juan, just like I had done some graphology on Jack and some of the Zodiac writings. And the purpose for this uh, is to kind of show you guys how true what I say about graphology is. So when I, um, I looked at this handwriting, I immediately took a look at the fact that there was more white than dark space. What that really means is that there's more white paper showing than there is writing on the page. And that means that Juan is an intellectual rather than emotional person. The clear spacing between the words and the lines also means that he likes to he likes people to know exactly what it is that he means. Um, he's very clear about that and that he is organized. We have a consistent baseline and a firm pressure and a consistent size, either with the left or right. Even though the right obviously looks bigger, it is still consistent within itself. And the, and the right hand is consistent with it within itself, which makes him steady and reliable. The firm pressure means that there is high energy and the good line and word spacing means a clear thinker. Wide margins all the way around the sides means there's an excessive reserve and aloofness, which also includes some isolation. And I asked Juan, well, we've had a conversation previous to the show, but how did that fit the bill for who you believe you are? Hello. It, it was 100% like dead on. Yep. Good. Awesome. So Sister June in the world of graphology, and she's the one that wrote the um, class that I'm taking that has been redone by Val Wheel, says that the page is space made available for physical action. So it represents contact with the universe, the outside world. It reflects the writer's propensity for goal setting, need to exteriorize thoughts and movement towards others. So when I looked at this, wide margins all the way all around, these individuals tend to keep their psychological distance from others. They set themselves apart. Often they have a highly developed aesthetic sense and they appreciate beauty in its many forms. Money is important to them, but they do not necessarily spend it on themselves. Although they may enjoy public recognition, they are loners at heart and often found in academic, scientific, or artistic environments where they can isolate themselves and become immersed in their work. Short-term projects rather 
rather than long range planning is their preferred operational style. Let's, and, I, and we're gonna look to confirm this in the actual writing itself, but Juan, how again did that fit the bill? It's kind of like you were writing my life story. <laughs> 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 by looking at a piece of paper with, with which you just wrote on. Um, there is a psychological basis on, on in graphology and it has been studied for many, many, many years and these attributes have been proven. Um, now, of course, we can't go around using this in the court of law because just because you have traits of a, car uh, of a serial killer in your handwriting doesn't mean that you are a serial killer or you acted on it. So it can never be used to that degree. So where's my phone? I hear it going off. Oh, sorry, guys. That means we got about five minutes to rush me through this. All right, so let's look to confirm this. So when I looked at the dominant right hand for the graphology portion of it, I found that Juan is forceful, decisive, steady and reliable, distinctive, clear thinker, dynamic, and attention to detail. He dots all his I's and he crosses his T's. Carefully crossing the T-bar suggests you prefer accuracy over speed. Large word spacing further indicates the need for space from others. And the letter G in night indicates a desire for culture or refinement and intellectual environments. Usually has refined taste, is well-mannered, and has an appreciation for the arts, good books, and music. Dislikes being with coarse people. Culture is a factor in the crea creative process, suggestive aesthetic appreciation rather than creative pro productivity. Initiative. So he's a self-starter and eager to get going, takes action without being pushed, is quick to sense and take advantage of an opportunity, and doesn't mind being first to try something, and has the knack of instigating ideas and actions. So um, I, again, don't know Juan all that well. He has only been my engineer for the last few months. Um, but I do get a sense when I speak to him that many of these attributes are true. But I did not base any of this reading off of what I knew about him just off the handwriting alone. I literally went through my book and I looked at what the book talked about and represented in regards to the handwriting. And I applied those factors to it. And again, let us um, let us hear whether or not you believe those attributes were correct Vaughn. well let me just put it this way uh everything you're doing now uh is way more accurate than astrology right right like this couldn't ap apply to anybody else because nobody else is going to write identical to you you are your own individual and as much as we can make an identification based on individuality on handwriting characteristics and identifying traits um you can't do that with astrology yeah astrology the month of may could apply to every person in month of may right right and i'm <laughs> I, so i don't really listen to those things too much but this gravology thing really kicks me in the pants and i love it so let me do some applications of some of the best known sayings throughout lifetime um to give you guys kind of this understanding that one has this very tall upper zone which are these l's that stick up here these very tall t's like we've seen in some of the zodiac stuff um very tall let's see h's so he has a very tall upper zone as we call it and and some of the sayings that we talk about in the upper zone, I'm going to read off here, but you have to realize that the upper zone is related to the head and to the brain. So um, some of the sayings that are attributed to upper zone writers is building castles in the air, has high flown ideas, head is in the clouds, a, highly, a high and mighty attitude, has a good head on their shoulders, intellectual snob, two heads are better than one, and large lower zones, which are these G's, these very long tails that we see here, um, means that he likes to jump to it, put your foot into it, put your foot down, mover and shaker, and let's get down to business because the lower zone is actually attributed to your legs and feet, which have to do with activity. So um, again, I went back and I said, how do some of these old time sayings um, fit you, Juan? And so w your response was, I think, something to the effect that um, you felt like you were looking in a mirror. I said it felt like I was talking to the reflection in the mirror. <laughs> I love it. This stuff is so awesome. That just gave me goosebumps. <laughs> All right, so what I did was here so side by side to show you guys. I got about a minute, and we might have to continue this next week. But um, we can see here how the um, handwriting looks 
completely different from one to the next. And you would almost suggest that one looks like, especially on the non-dominant hand, that this one was written by a fourth grader, while this one was actually written by somebody who has had a um, good long time and habituation with their handwriting. So dominant versus non-dominant handwriting and the gross features are fluidity and speed found here in the, in the dominant versus this awkward and slow that's found in the right. Um, it's tight and small here versus the large and tremorous over to the right. And the amount of words found on each line actually even varies, which can also be a reason why the lines, even though the Zodiac wrote three communications, they all didn't come out on the same exact line, even though he used the same words. Um, rounded forms, which we see a lot more rounded forms in the um, dominant handwriting versus the angular um, Let's see if we can find that here, where we see the tremors and the angles in some of this writing based on the lack of fine motor control. Well, you guys, that kind of ends it here. We are going to come back next week. And what I'm going to show you is how I made the identification between these two sets of writing and then how that's going to apply to the communications and the Zodiac's writing and the possibility that he absolutely used his non-dominant hand for some of these writings. So I hope everybody has enjoyed this week. Thank you, Juan, for letting me use you. I'll use you again quickly next week for that identification between the two hands. And um, we'll move on into those Zodiac letters. Thank you so much, Juan. Anytime. Have a great day, everybody. Have a wonderful weekend. We'll see you next Friday.